This is Twit. Uh, CES determined, determined not to shut down one more time. Uh, but only, what did you say, Father Robert? A quarter of the normal people, about 40,000 instead of the usual 170,000, mm -hmm. showed up because a uh, fear of COVID. A lot of companies, uh, some of the biggest companies said, yeah, we're not going to go. There were still plenty of keynotes, some of them done by Zoom. Uh, there, was, there was stuff to see. Were, were all the halls full of uh, exhibitors? They were not. They okay. were most definitely not. My favorite is uh, the Central Hall. So the, if if you're not familiar with CES, the Central Hall is where all the big players go. That's your Sony. That's your Microsoft. That's, that's where your all Google. the TVs are. Exactly. Yeah. All the all the blinky shiny ones. Uh, I think the best representation of CES 2022 was where the LG booth should have been. It is a premium spot. As you walk into the hall, you yes. have to pass by LG. Yes, they had that video waterfall last year or two years ago. Right, right. right. And the tunnel. They always do something. The tunnel. They had yeah. nothing. Nothing. It was literally, the space was empty. It had some signage. And it oh, had dear. QR codes so you could go there and scan it and it would show you what would be there. Oh, my gosh. Did, did they make, <laughs> were these decisions like last minute and yeah. so they didn't have a way to reconfigure the space or what happened? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, what they, CES put out a press release. They said, look, we've lost 40 or right. 50 vendors, but we brought on 200. Well, the 200, they were basically saying, uh, we'll, we'll give you a booth. Just come, just come and do something. We'll <laughs> give you a booth. There were a lot of booths that actually still had like the, the opening desk and the starter paper there, the entire show. So they gave it to someone and they didn't show up. That happened quite a bit. Now, that's not to say that it was it was a ghost town. I actually had some of the best conversations at, at this CES than I've ever had because there wasn't that constant crush of people. There wasn't that need to move huge amounts of people through your booth. So I had some great technical discussions with the people at BMW and with some of the people from the greater UK, uh, UK technical group. Uh, down in the startup pavilion, it it was it was actually nice. I don't think we're ever going to have a CES like this again. So I'm kind of glad I went. Yeah, and and one the one reason to go to a CES, especially is for TVs, to look at things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to to understand in a press release. You can get right. all the tech specs and so forth. But for instance, this LG OLED throne, you never <laughs> if you don't get to sit in it, <laughs> you probably don't appreciate the. Uh, did you get to sit in it? Uh, no, no. no. I, I actually there's <laughs> there were two things that I think were the standout visual wise. Yeah, the standouts of CES. One of them was outside. Uh, it was BMW. BMW had their the e color card. changing vehicle. Yeah, it was an ebook. Uh, interesting. It was fun. I I love Gonzo technology. I sat there and I took five minutes of footage because it is so compelling. Uh, very impractical. But then again. That's one of the things that I enjoy about CES. I want impractical tech. I want. I remember seeing demonstrations of the self-driving cars 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is the sort of stuff that it doesn't look practical right now, but you will find a practical way to this put it in This is kind of what production. bothers me about CES is there's a lot of non-starters. There's a lot of, you know, uh, kind of sci-fi. that it isn't. I get well, it, yeah. But that's what, I mean... The, that's what the World's Fair used to be, or the the great expo. Right. The, the so maybe I should think of it as a World's Fair and not a trade show. Well, no, not anymore. I mean, I the last time I went to CES, I, I've been a couple times in the past fifteen years, but in the early days, it was what mattered was the meetings in the rooms. Yeah, they, right. they still People. had booth babes. So yeah, yeah. there've been some. It, CES has changed. It's gone through several different rates. So when it started, it was just a place for retailers to find out what they were going to stock for the holiday season. That was it. Yeah. That, that was the yeah. whole reason for the, the conference to exist. Then it became, well, let's show you some of the crazy stuff. We're going to show you a prototype for a flying car. We're going to show you the prototype for a nuclear-powered washing machine. Completely impractical, would never, ever make it out there. But it was, it was nice for a young geek to say, wow, I wonder if I could actually make that. Could I make that in a practical way? Then the iPhone came, and I, I, I will say... <laughs> Uh, for three years there, CES became iPhone accessories. Yeah, show. yeah. Uh, and I just, it was the worst, the worst years ever. And now it's kind of a mix. Yes, you've got a lot of those meetings where people are deciding what they're going to stock, but you're also getting a little bit more of the, hey, we pushed the tech to where we think it, it could be in 10 years. We have no plans to manufacture this in the near future, but 
do you like it? And, and I kind of like that mix. Yeah. So tell us some of the things you, uh, besides the color shifting car, are, they're not going to make that as a real product, are they? No. I mean, they're probably going to include little bits and pieces. You can have it on the doing bumper. But doing an entire car, yeah. yeah. An entire car, no. It's, yeah. It would be too expensive and too easy to break. There was something down in the startup pavilion. It was from the Greater UK Tech uh, Corp uh, Foundation. Basically, they did a, a pavilion for the UK. And the spokesperson for this group was this robot that they had created that was using machine learning to answer people. Now, it sounds cheesy. And when I first heard about God, it, it sounds said, so cheesy. It sounds like exactly. It's so cheesy. <laughs> exactly the but, stuff but, that I hated. See, when yes. I was filming it, I was like, yeah, okay. So this is basically, uh, this is an Alexa with a robot face. Yeah. But then, then I went behind the robot and I filmed it. And I saw people interacting with the robot. And I realized, oh my God, there's something actually here. People were enjoying having a con actual conversations with something that was not alive. And, so it was and a robot? Yes, you, what did it look like? There was an actual robot with a. And I, it was I very West. I have a connected. picture right here. It's a West World, basically. Okay. Right. It's, so, but it, it, it actually engaged people. People were, were actually enthusiastic about talking to the robot, asking it questions, seeing what kind of responses it would come back with. That that was probably the most successful demo at CES. I think it was way beyond what they thought they were going to get. <laughs> I think the problem with that for me is that in 1938, um, yeah. Westinghouse Burr. Electric Corporation yeah. <laughs> had Moto Man. And to be fair, Moto Man was, was not an AI. It, had a, it was using telephone relays, but it... It did. The, it smoked. It even smoked. Right. Um, but it, it, so so it's been you know a really really long time. This is and just we've creepy. Got <laughs> and it's not really. I mean, this isn't going to be doing my dishes anytime soon, right? I mean, this right, is, right. Yeah, this is a more of. But, a, but that's why, why it's also not Uncanny Valley. Yeah. Because they didn't try to make it human. It's obviously synthetic. But they were it, able to sort of. They were. It able does to make get you think about what is human and what is it that you know. We look at this and it, and you really very quickly anthropomorphize it and say, "Oh yeah, I see feelings." And well, it, it, it is anthropomorphic. We don't have to anthropomorphize it. It correct. looks it like a, a person. They're doing it on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think it's worth noting that you know, almost what eighty years ago, a similar robot existed at a yeah. similar conference. Yeah. 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 But now, if you want, if you want what was actually useful from CES, buy and not not even a question. It was all the biotech, uh, and Avid. Avid was the standout, one hundred percent. So they're the ones who make the the rats, the rapid antigen tests, and they were handing those things <laughs> oh, out. Thank God candy. they don't make rats. Okay. <laughs> no, but but their other tech, they 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 created a device that can, it looks for markers in the blood that are released when there is a concussive brain injury. And now they've created a, a handheld device that you put a drop of blood into a cartridge and it can detect if a person Where has had a concussive brain injury. Before. Uh huh. Well, I, I know, I know. And that's what I said. I said, you understand there's shades of Theranos here. They said, yeah, but this but is this actually works. FDA approved. Okay. This actually works. Okay. They also have a deep brain stimulation device. It's worn like a pacemaker, and anyone who's suffering from Parkinson's can now have relief. Uh, they've also made a patch that does real time monitoring of everything from glucose levels to blood chemistry. Keto. Uh, it's I doing mean, uh, ketosis. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. I mean, th this is actually technology that I was like, if you gave this gave this to me, I would actually use it. Uh, I, I would find Apple a useful. Has this is not future tech. Clearly, seen this as one of the Apple looks like they're going. They're looking really hard at AR, at cars, and at health. And they've already got a product that is, you know, kind of uh, their entree into the health world, which is the Apple Watch. And it's very clear they're looking to this as one of the next big ways for them to make oh, yes. money, a bit multi-billion-dollar industry. Of course, number one would be blood sugar, non-invasive uh, blood sugar mm -hmm. uh, measurements. There's 14 million diabetics in the United States who would all immediately buy an Apple Watch if it could give them their blood sugar uh, without a prick. Um, so, Amy, let's talk about that. Uh, health, is that the next big thing? Yeah. Well, there's a couple of drivers for, for why health tech is accelerating. One is there's a big component uh, with AI. So AI for predictive analytics and... Uh, you kind of need AI to make this work because the signals are right. so weak. 
you need right. something that can be trained so that it will recognize those signals. Right. Um, so that's yeah. happening. The other thing that's happening is the quantified self movement that you know was sort of coming and going in fits and starts and the people like that though every athlete i know wears a fitbit or a Apple they do Watch now or, yeah they do now but i think if you were to go back 15 years at ces when quantified self was kind of a, everybody was talking about it, it it never happened but the technology and the price points have you know sort of aligned um so you've got younger people interested in optimizing everything from sleep to you know endurance and everything else and then you've got an aging population um, that is affluent enough and tech literate enough to to want to invest in devices. Yeah, we and knew the boomers would that, kind of move the needle as we have our yeah. entire lives. Uh, we're a giant market and now we're aging. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you've got COVID, which has shifted everybody into thinking more about health and diagnostics. So yes. it's kind of a perfect storm. Uh, last year, I think it was, or two years ago at CES, the smart toilet launched which was um, research that Stanford started in whatever, 2010. I mean, it's like putting a bunch, <clears throat> putting a bunch of sensors in the one place that you really Poop analytics are, uh, as Huge. disgusting as that sounds, clearly Huge. could be a very big health benefit. Right. Didn't so they use it at the University of North Carolina? They, they, they uh, use it for dorms so they yeah. could detect when they, where there was COVID-19. Well, yeah, right. in fact, we know they're analyzing sewage uh, and uh, effluent to, to find COVID uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, viruses in populations. Uh, and it's been right. a very good indicator. And there are startups that are there's a there's a company in England that will that for a while was before we were constantly getting our noses swabbed. Um, this was a voluntary spit into a tube at a grocery store yeah. uh, where you could get your DNA tested and then they would give you a, a wristband that would glow different colors and, and help you shop. Basically, it was like DNA based. <laughs> that <laughs> is weird. So that is weird, and it's not a one-off. So I, my point is, well, like, I know a lot of people who have done these tests that say this is how you should eat. Twenty uh, Three and Me was even offering that kind of information. Right, and genetically, if you talk to this any, is what you should be eating. I don't know if it's snake oil or real. It's it, right. It, it's if you talk to any geneticist, they'll they'll tell you this is a little bit like a horoscope. Yeah. You know, you can use it for entertainment yeah. purposes, but yes. like, don't base your horoscope. Any, Perfect decisions, you know. Yes. Um, yeah, th there was an episode of Farscape where uh, they used a um, uh, sort of a DNA test to determine who you would be compatible with in relationships. Yeah, so, there is actually a DNA. Maybe we could get a globe band for that. We no, already have. Dating. By the way, we already have that system. It's in the nose, and it's very oh. effective. <laughs> 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 there's a lot of you're laughing, but there's a lot of evidence uh, that genetically your best match battery is exhausted. By the way, your battery is exhaused, Father. I, I have exhausted it's, my battery. It's oh, time, I wasn't time to plugged put your in. battery to bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> but there's oh, a lot no. of evidence. There's a lot of evidence that we are that you, your genetic best genetic match is somebody who smells good to you that your nose is already doing that and it wouldn't be surprising if it makes sense from an evolutionary point of view right but, i mean i think that the thing is is how do you monetize all that and so part of the isn't that a shame that that's always the metric well again look at you know where do you grow apple Apple's making phones and computers and there's a lot of our you know a lot of our models show that that you know the phone is going to be dead in a couple of years i know it's hard to wrap your head around just like so father you, robert gonna... it's uh, exhausted yeah <laughs> i am <laughs> completely exhausted <laughs> so <laughs> health is so big and so broken that i think companies are are like seeing a viable opportunity to disrupt in the in the yes. sort of clayton christensen innovators are. dilemma that's right? i so think part of the of problem that's part yeah. of the problem in this country is we don't do it unless you can make money at it. It's one of the reasons we have very expensive pharmaceuticals in place of simple solutions that no one can patent. That we don't, we do high tech medicine, but we don't do low tech medicine. And I think there's a lot of evidence that outcomes could be better if uh, there were, you know, there were perhaps, you know, better relationships between doctors and patients instead of better machinery between them it, in, a, in a way doesn't doesn't that desire to make it profitable mislead us somewhat right so this as far as i'm concerned is the tragedy of of the the free market yes um, the free market left you know the free market is like algorithmic determinism right if if left to its own devices it will continue to soldier on perfect analogy 
Perfect right? Analogy. Whether that, that's good for everybody. Yes. So there is a balance, but again, it forces a different mental model. And at the moment, you're either libertarian or you're Republican or you're a, you know, a strict interpretationist. Everybody needs a label. Um, if we could dispense with the labels and get on with the business of uh, creating better equity for everybody, I think we'd be in a better spot. Yeah, and um, I understand you need uh, capital to do some of these more expensive things. Right. So the the antidote to that is is like just like throwing a shit ton of money at basic research. We yeah. see other governments doing this. We see China. That's doing who a needs lot of to this. do it. Government is in United theory not motivated by profit. Government is in theory motivated right. by societal outcome. Right. And I would argue that that is a very, and I'm, I'm in a very high, you know, I'm in a very privileged place, place, which means I'm, but I'm not wealthy enough to not pay taxes. So I'm just in that bracket. that's paying time. <laughs> Isn't that the worst? <laughs> you, you yeah. make a lot of money, but you're not wealthy yeah. enough not to pay taxes. But I'm not wealthy taxes. enough. Yeah. It's just the exactly. worst. Yeah, I agree. So like take my money and please <laughs> throw it at science. And it doesn't mean that the government does everything, but it means we need to have better public private partnerships. It also means that government has to be held I'm with you, 100%. accountable. Part of the reason why this James Webb telescope took so long to launch funding was because it was working funding and it was working at the typical pace of government, which right. is probably not right for everybody going forward. Right. Right. 